This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending today, everyone. And Brittany, you can begin your presentation. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Robin. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I first just want to, to um, let folks know that I, uh, my voice might sound a little weird. Um, I potentially am coming down with something and I think it sounds better now than it did 30 minutes ago. But um, anyway, I just wanted to apologize in advance for that. Yeah, so my name is Brittany Barker and um, I'm happy to be here today. And you can find uh, my website info down at the corner of the slide and also some social media profiles. And I'll also have my contact info um, at the end of my presentation and Robin will be um, sending that out tomorrow as well. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> so before I get started, I just wanted to first acknowledge um, my past and present collaborators on the work I'll be presenting on today and also uh, past and current funding sources. So uh, key collaborators in developing the modeling tool that I'm going to be talking about today and um, also with developing models include Dr. Len Koop, who is at, works at the Oregon IPM Center and Department of Horticulture, um, where I'm located, Tyson Weprich, Fritzi Grevstad, Dan Upper, and Garrica Cook. And the grant that's funding um, the work that I'm presenting on today involves a lot of forecast delivery and outreach. And our collaborators on this aspect of the project include Teresa Crimmins, Alyssa Rosemartin, and Aaron Postumus at the USA National Phenology Network, which also I'll be referring to as uh, USA NPN. Uh, for funding sources, uh, past work was primarily funded by the USDA APHIS PPQ in support of the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program, also known as CAPS. And current funding source is um, USDA <clears throat> NIFA AFRI Tactical Sciences and Biosecurity Program with uh, Len Koop as a PI and me and Teresa Crimmins as co-PIs. So decision support tools are essential for preventing and managing the invasion of non-native invasive species. Forecasting tools that address when to expect an invasive species are important for early detection efforts and also for management. Phenology models predict the development and the activities of a temperature um, ectothermic organism across its life cycle. Obviously, phenology models can be developed for endotherms as well, but I'm focusing today on um, insects in particular. So this type of information gives you an idea of when to look for an invasive pest. In this way, we can detect it early and rapidly respond to it before it begins to establish and spread. For example, we can make sure we install detection devices on time, um, conduct timely monitoring, and also apply treatments in order to manage um, a population that may already be established. Forecasting tools that address where uh, to find an invasive species are also very important. As an example, climate suitability models predict the risk of establishment of an invasive species um, across a given area. In this way, we know where to look. So this is also important for uh, you know, focusing our resources on areas that are at highest risk of establishment. So again, we can make sure to detect a population invasive species early before it begins to establish and spread. As an example, um, I'm showing here in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, a climate suitability model um, that my co-authors and I published just this last year for invasive, an invasive fungal pathogen that causes boxwood blight disease. And so this uh, and fungal pathogen has been spreading in the co contiguous United States, which I'm going to also refer to simply as CONUS. So the areas that are warm, have these warm colors, are at highest risk of establishment. This is the index we're talking about here is called the ecoclimatic index. In contrast, these areas that are dark blue or completely um, gray or, you know, just have no color, those are at low risk of establishment. So in terms of conducting surveillance for this spreading pathogen, we obviously want to make sure that we focus on these areas where we find these warm colors and not waste our time and money on areas where it's unlikely to be found. Okay, so I am going to first uh, provide you with an outline of my talk. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce a modeling platform that I have been um, helped being to develop since I've been at Oregon State University. I'm then going to talk about a model that we developed for the Emerald Ash Bore, which I'll also refer to simply as EAB, that is um, run with the DDRP platform. Um, in this section, I'll talk about the rationale and applications of the model. 
and then discuss how we developed the model and then validated forecasts, and then how you can access the real-time forecast to help with your own surveillance and monitoring or management activities. And then finally, I'll conclude by talking about our future work and the key points that I want you to take away from this presentation. So the DDRP platform um, stands, well, the DDRP stands for Degree Day Establishment Risk and Phenological Event Maps. DDRP integrates phenology and climate suitability models. So this is pretty distinct from other modeling tools available in the sense that typically you just have a pro, uh, platforms that do one or the other. So DDRP produces maps and of phenology and climate suitability, therefore addressing both the question of when and where to find an invasive species or any other species that you may be modeling. It uses a process-based approach. And what I mean by this is that it's not based on correlations. It's actually based on physiological information about the organism. In particular, it models phenology based on degree days, degree day accumulation. De a degree day is a form of heat unit. <clears throat> the climate suitability model is based on climate stress accumulation, specifically cold and heat stress that influence the survival of the organism. And it was designed for real-time decision support. So you can also use it to produce models or to produce forecasts for historical time periods or also like a future time period um, or like a far future time period. But it was really designed to be used for the current season so that you can um, regularly check the website, check, you know, get these real-time forecasts to help with your decision making. And the platform is open source. It's written in the R programming language. So for those of you in the audience who may be like programmers or actual or modelers yourself, you're welcome to go download the source code at github.com forward slash vbarker505 forward slash ddrp underscore v2. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, one of the advantages of DDRP over existing modeling tools is the fact that um, it integrates phenology and climate suitability mapping. It also accepts daily climate data at any spatial and temporal resolution. And so um, the spatial resolution basically means like if you have like, uh, so it takes like these raster, these this gridded climate data, and it can be um, very fine scale. Um, or it could be, you know, large, large scale. Um, you could also like do it for any region that you're interested in if you have the appropriate um, climate data. It produces extended model forecasts. And what I mean by that is that um, we have short-term climate forecasts and also use 10-year averages of climate to forecast phenology and climate suitability over the entire year. So for example, for this year, if I produce a forecast um, today, uh, it has the capability to like forecast until uh, December 31st of this year. It has a relatively simple parameterization that makes it applicable to many different species. And so basically what I mean by this is that you have some like phenology models that are so complex that you may only be able to use it for a single species or maybe like a few closely related species. And DDRP was intended to be used for many different species. It uses species specific data and includes population variation. So what I mean by this is that it's not necessarily just based on a single like temperature threshold. It has multiple parameters that to describe like the duration of each of the life stages, um, for example. And for population variation, what I mean by this is like if you think about emerald ash borer, for example, Typically, the adults, um, you don't all of a sudden see them on a single day, the, you know, when they're starting to merge, you typically see a spread, right? So like a distribution of emergence times. And so DDRP uh, attempts to take that into account uh, with several different parameters. Just to give you a very brief modeling overview, um, you can find more details about the methods of the platform in uh, our PLOS One publication in 2020. Um, the platform has two major inputs. The first is a species parameter file that has um, information about temperature thresholds for development and for climate stress. So the climate suitability modeling is optional DDRP. Um, we also have parameters that describe the duration of each of uh, four major life stages, and those durations are in degree day units. We also, as I mentioned, have parameters that describe uh, developmental variation within the population. We call these like these cohort parameters. So basically like when development across these different cohorts um, begins, in, you know, during at the beginning or whenever, um, yeah. So like, you know, tied at the beginning of the growing season, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the second major input is gridded daily climate data. In particular, 
minimum temperature and maximum temperature for your study region of interest. Okay, so the sec second major um, component is the daily time step. So the two inputs are fed into this daily time step and DDRP separately models phenology and climate suitability. And the phenology model degree days accumulate um, if the temperature is within the uh, lower and upper developmental threshold of the organism you're modeling. And then the platform predicts different phenological events. And I'm going to provide examples of what I mean by this in a few minutes. It predicts life stages that are present and also how many generations have been completed. It also has several um, different, it ha has many more different outputs as well. <clears throat> For the climate suitability model, it predicts heat stress accumulation and cold stress accumulation. And so that stress begins to accumulate if a threshold is um, is exceeded. So for example, if, it, if it's too hot, if it exceeds the heat stress threshold, heat stress units begin to accumulate. From this information, the program, the platform then estimates the potential distribution. And this, these are referred to areas that are not excluded by the heat stress and cold stress. So in this cartoon here, the white areas where it says not excluded, there has not been enough stress accumulation to exclude the species. In contrast, these areas that are dark gray and light gray, those represent areas that are excluded by either moderate stress or severe stress. The dark gray areas um, are um, <clears throat> areas that where climate prevents long-term establishment. So it's very unlikely that the species will establish there. The, the light gray, these areas under moderate stress exclusion represent um, areas where short-term establishment may be possible. They could also represent areas of uncertainty. So we're not quite sure if the species could establish there or not. So finally, in the post-processing stage, uh, step three here, DDRP analyzes the model outputs from the phenology and climate suitability model. It integrates the different maps and then produces the final outputs. So um, we've developed 20 DDRP models to date. 16 of those are for, uh, or 16 of the models are for invasive insects. So you'll notice, and also like Emerald Dashboard is here on the first row, and I'm going to be talking more about EAB in a minute. Um, if you look at the list here, you'll notice that most of these species, with the exception of emerald ash borer and the light brown apple moth, they are not yet, or they're not yet, hopefully they will not ever be present, but they're not present in CONUS, or actually I think, well, some of them might be in Hawaii, I'm not actually sure, but they're not present in CONUS. Um, and the reason for this is, as I mentioned, APHIS PPQ funded a lot of the earlier work on DDRP. And they are really interested in uh, the CAPS program. They, basically their job is to conduct surveillance so that these species do not become established. So one of the reasons that they wanted these risk maps and also the phenology, you know, these maps of risk um, climate suitability and phenology is so they can make sure that they're uh, conducting surveillance in the right places and also at the right time of year. Okay, so we also have models for three different biological control insects. These include the Japanese knotweed psyllid, black margin loose strife beetle, and northern tamarisk beetle. And then finally, we have a model for an invasive fungal pathogen that causes boxwood blight called Calinectria pseudonaviculata. <clears throat> this is the homepage for DDRP, and I'm going to come back to this later when I talk about where you can access real time forecasts. But essentially, you visit this web page and you can find all of the model outputs. So the outputs are in raster format, specifically geotiffs. So if you want to make your own um, maps, you can import those into a, whatever GIS program that you or a GIS that you use. Um, it also produces ping files or PNG, these image files. <clears throat> and the forecasts are produced every two to three days. So you can regularly visit here to get updated forecasts as the season progresses. So you'll see a short description of the program here. You can access the publication, <clears throat> the you know, open source code, the user, uh, user manual. And in this table here, you'll see, uh, I'm showing a screenshot of just the first four rows, the first four models. So we have like Asian longhorn beetle, Asiatic rice borer, honeydew moth, and then here's emerald ash borer. And the rest of the columns are showing uh, thumbnails of some of the model outputs. So in the first column here, we see predictions of the timing of first spring adults. Second column is first egg hatch, current stage and generations in this third column, and then the number of generations per year. And like I said, I'm going to provide more examples um, of these maps in just a few minutes. 
We also have um, some versions of DDRP that include additional factors besides temperature. So I mentioned that we had developed those uh, three models for the bio or for models for three of those biocontrol insects. And these particular models include photoperiod factors. So uh, these species, including Japanese knotweed psyllid, are sensitive to day length. So as we know, um, day lengths vary throughout the year. They also vary latitudinally. And so these insects are really, um, they, they enter and exit, some of them enter and exit diapause in, <clears throat> in response to those uh, day lengths. And so these models predict voltanism in photoperiod sense, yeah, in those insects. And this work was published by uh, Fritzi Gravstad and, excuse me, in 2022 in Ecological Applications. So this map right here is showing voltanism, so the number of generations per year for Japanese knotweed psyllid, based on averages of climate between 2010 and 2019. Okay, so why is this type of map important? Well, I mean, for one thing, we can better understand where this insect is going to be most effective at attacking Japanese knotweed. Obviously, if the insect can complete more generations, it's more likely that it'll establish in the long term and, you know, reach um, higher population sizes. So in this case, it looks like that it's going to be more successful at these northern latitudes, particularly in parts of the Midwest. And then, as I mentioned, we developed that model for the invasive fungal pathogen causing boxwood blight. So this version of DDRP also includes moisture factors. Um, so we have like precipitation and then um, we estimate relative humidity uh, from uh, different uh, climate variables. And so uh, we have dry stress, heat stress and cold stress. And so you can see like a uh, box of the fungal pathogen is predicted to be excluded from most areas of the Southwest and Great Basin. Um, and uh, but it is widespread on the east. And the infection risk, that can be important because um, people that are out doing management or surveillance of this pathogen, um, they can better understand when the outbreaks are going to occur if they run these like throughout these forecasts throughout the season. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the rationale and applications of our DDRP model for Emerald Ash Borer. So um, probably most of you in the audience today um, already know a bit about emerald ash borer. So I'm not gonna not gonna give a huge background on the species, but um, I'll talk you know I'll talk about it a little bit and also talk about its life cycle and where it's distributed. So emerald ash borer, Agrilus planipennis, is a very small shiny green beetle. It's native to Asia, and it's been in the United States since at least 2002, uh, where it was first detected in Michigan. The larvae feed at the interface of the phloem and xylem of the ash trees, which cuts off the movement of food um, and, um, uh, excuse me, the water to the canopy, killing the tree within just a few years. So um, the insect has destroyed millions of ash trees since it was first detected. Um, up to 99% of all ash trees are typically killed within eight to 10 years uh, once the beetle arrives in an area. And unfortunately, EAB was found for the first time on the West Coast in Forest Grove, Oregon, just this past year in 2022. Um, and I'm actually colleagues with the person who found this population. Um, <clears throat> he was picking up his kids from some sort of summer camp or a, a sporting event, and he's a botanist. And so he saw these ash trees and noticed that they looked really sick or they were dying. And then he you know, saw the presence of these D-shaped exit holes, which is a telltale sign that emerald ash borer is present. And so since this happened, there's been obviously, I mean, there's like a quarantine in Washington County, and I actually live about 30 minutes away from where this population was found. I mean, it's a really big deal. Um, you know, there, so it's pretty bad news. And unfortunately, it is predicted that there could be the entire functional loss of Oregon ash, Fraxinus latifolia, when, you know, as these outbreaks occur, if it continues to spread, establish and spread. So the invaded distribution of emerald ash borer in North America is pretty extensive so far. It also occurs in five Canadian provinces, which is not shown on this map. This map was produced on October 11th of 2022, so pretty recent. The red circles are these EAB county detections. So that means it's established or, uh, or actually at least detected um, wherever you see the red circle. So it's present in 36 U.S. states. It's most widespread in the Midwest and also the Northeast. It is on, has an ongoing range expansion. It's expanding, for example, in the South. So some of these uh, detection records in Texas and Louisiana, those are relatively new, some of them just within the last like few years. 
It's also present um, in the Boulder and Fort Collins area of Colorado, and it's continuing to spread uh, westward in the Midwest region. The expansion has been a little bit, from what I understand, it's been a little bit slower in Canada, but it is still happening. And as I mentioned, it's now present in, it's been detected in the Forest Grove area um, of Oregon. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about Europe today. I'm assuming probably that um, people in the audience are from the US. I'm not sure, but I hope maybe this recording might be uh, viewed by uh, folks in Europe because um, the models that I'm going to be talking about are applicable to this region as, or this continent as well. So EAB is a major threat to ash in Europe as well. The EAB was found in Moscow, Russia in 2003, and since then it has become um, widespread in the Moscow region and also in uh, areas south of there. It's been detected as far south as this border area where the, uh, the Caucasus start, this ca Caucasus region down like by the Black Sea, and it's also been spreading in eastern Ukraine, as if they don't have enough problems already. And uh, it, so it's not yet present in other parts of like, you know, Western or Eastern Europe, but it's basically right on the border. It's a serious threat to the three native species of ash in Europe. Um, none of them are complete, are, are um, uh, I don't know if immune, not immune is not the right word, but they're basically they're all susceptible to attack by EAB. And one thing I thought was interesting that I just learned recently <laughs> is that um, EAB also is a threat to olive production in Europe. So, you know, all, a lot of olive, um, olive is grown there. And so apparently EAB can complete at least part of its life cycle on olive. <clears throat> okay, so the life cycle of EAB is shown on this slide. And um, I'm gonna start at the beginning of the season. So, so um, throughout most of the range, at least in CONUS, uh, in North America in general, um, the, the, you know, the larvae, um, or excuse me, they overwinter as these J larvae. They're called J larvae because they curl up and it's shaped a little bit like a fish hook or a J. That's what the JL stands for here. Um, so then pupation begins at the start of the season as um, the spring temperatures are warming up. Then the adults emerge, leaving that D-shaped ex exit holes. The adults feed on the margins of the ash leaves, and then they find each other, they mate, um, and they lay eggs in the ash bark, so like in these bark crevices or under the scales of the bark. And then the eggs hatch into larvae, which then tunnel into the tree, creating these S-shaped galleries as they feed. And so as I mentioned, the larvae are the most damaging um, life stage of uh, the emerald ash borer. And then they have a few different larval instars, and then you know they uh, turn into these J larvae again. And um, so one thing I'll mention is that our model <clears throat> is really developed for the univoltine life cycle, meaning that the one one generation per year in very areas that have uh, relatively cool summers and cold winters, the emerald ash borer is uh, can be semi-voltine, meaning it could take two years to complete its life cycle. <clears throat> Okay, so going back to this question of when to expect invasive species. So when will EAB life stages be present? And this is actually a, a pretty important question because um, real-time forecasts can support surveillance and management. Just as an example, 90% of the life cycle of EAB is spent under inside the tree, right? And so um, really we're looking for the adults. That's like a sign. That's one of the only ways we can know if EAB has, um, is present at a location. So if we make sure we go out at the right time of year, we can um, ensure that we find those adults. And that's important because once the adults come out, they can fly or disperse to, um, you know, to other locations. We want to um, detect them early and then, well, uh, try to eradicate or at least like reduce, significantly reduce that population before they can further spread. Um, so for example, like hang out, hang traps up or just go out and um, do visual surveys. So for management, um, <clears throat> Ash trees um, are often um, treated with the systemic insecticides, and the timing of the insecticides uh, treatments are, it can be pretty important. So some of the insecticides target both the adult and the larval stage, or maybe just the larval stage. And I actually am not an expert. I don't know a ton about the insecticides, but I do know that the timing is important. So if you apply it too late, you could like, you know, basically not kill the, the, uh, the appropriate, you know, the life stage that's susceptible, like won't be present. Um, in terms of biocontrol, um, so Dr. Julie Gould a few weeks ago gave a really good talk about different biocontrol agents for EAB. And these um, biocontrol agents target specific life stages of uh, EAB. 
for example, and forgive me if I'm not saying the names right, I think I am, but um, Oobias, agrilli, uh, they lay their eggs inside the egg of emerald ash borer. So this is a picture of an emerald ash borer egg. All right. So you need to make sure that that agent, um, you know, that that the it's if you're going to release them, it obviously would be good to make sure that EAB eggs are going to be there. Um, the these three species right here, Tetrasticus and the two Spathius species, um, they actually target the larval stage of EAB. And so again, we um, want to be able to know if the larval stage of EAB is going to be present for release, or also even like a location. Maybe these agents won't be successful at all if like the location, if there's just not going to be really good alignment of the different life stages of EAB and these agents. Also, where can EAB establish? Okay, so there have been um, several climate suitability and risk models in general developed for EAB to predict where it can occur. Um, however, it is still somewhat unclear if the coldest and hottest parts of the ranges of ash are at risk. For example, um, there's been a lot of like discussion and um, kind of <clears throat> research on whether these kind of like northern these range boundaries of I think there's like three species of ash that extend this far north but basically whether EAB can um, establish in those areas or maybe those ash can be spared um, similarly we don't know if these areas so like far south maybe these areas could be too hot for EAB and the same thing goes for Europe there's actually been fairly little work on climate suitability for EAB and in, um, in Europe so it's thought maybe that it may not be as damaging in the northern UK or maybe like these Scandinavian countries and in Russia. And also we have no idea of like which areas may be too hot for the pest. So most available climate suitability models are based on historical climates, but as we all know, climate has changed significantly even over like the past five or 10 years. So we can't necessarily rely on these models that use climate data from like 1970 to 2000. Those may not be um, you know, as accurate as if we use climate data for the present day or kind of also looking forward. So yeah, we basically need real time to use present day climates um, to get a better idea of where EAB may establish. Okay, so you may be thinking to yourself if you um, are a modeler or already used, um, you know, for example, like it, I just wanted to point out that like, it's not like we're the first people to develop phenology models or climate suitability models for EAB. But the point is, is that most models that have been developed today, first of all, most have not been operationalized to provide regularly updated forecasts. Um, the exceptions, the major exceptions that I'm aware of are uh, SAFARIS, and so the SAFARIS stands for Spatial Analytic Framework for Advanced Risk Information Systems. They have weekly forecasts of adult activity, and the USA Phenology Network, USA NPN, they have daily pheno forecasts of adult activity, and I'm going to talk more about this later, but this model, their, for, their previous model has now been replaced with the DDRP model, but they've had this uh, pheno forecast for EAB for several, several years now. Okay, so first of all, I want to just point out, these are just for adults. Those phenology models are just for adult activity. DDRP predicts events for adults, but also all the major life stages of EAB, and it includes climate suitability. And I mentioned um, that a, a DDRP can incorporate um, <clears throat> developmental variation. So it accounts for like the spread that you can see in the overwintering stage. So like when they emerge, when they begin developing in the spring. <clears throat> so now I'll talk a little bit about model development and uh, model performance. Excuse me, I'm just taking a drink. <clears throat> okay. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna give a very brief overview of the methods. Um, we actually do have a paper on this that um, has been dragging on too long. We do plan to submit it soon. And so there's gonna be a lot more details on what we did here. So I'm just summarizing it here. So the phenology submodel in DDRP addresses the question of when, the climate suitability model addresses the question of where. And both of these models were developed using um, previously published laboratory derived data. So for example, experiments where folks um, measured um, how development progresses at different temperatures, and also like maybe how uh, uh, temperatures may reduce survival <clears throat> of the EAB. Um, for the phenology model, we also used monitoring data, um, particularly observations of adult activity from five monitoring sites in Ohio and Michigan. 
for the climate suitability model, um, I was fortunate that there is daily a, a daily climate data set for China, which is part of the native range of EAB. And also a lot of the biocontrol agents come from, maybe all of them, I'm not sure actually, come from China. Um, and so I was able to further calibrate the model using these presence records. And I also use parts of the range of North, some of the records from North America too, to calibrate the model. To validate the model, um, I used 56 phenological observations from the Eastern United States collected over a 20 year period. And also I had four observations from Russia collected in 2013, 2014. Um, yeah, and then for the climate suitability model, I used 3,000 presence records from areas that were not used in model calibration. These include um, over 100 or at least I think a couple hundred records from Europe. Okay, so I'm showing you here the EAB life cycle again. Um, the reason for this is I want to point out what the model, the phenology model predicts. So the model assumes a start date of January 1st. The first phenological event it predicts is pupation. Second is adult emergence. Third, egg laying. Fourth, egg hatch. And then fifth, J larval development. Okay, so in particular, these predictions of adult emergence, egg laying, and egg hatch may be particularly important in terms of surveillance, uh, monitoring, and management. Now I'm going to give a demonstration of DDRP uh, for both North America and Europe for the year 2021. And um, the reason I use one of the reasons I use 2021 is just that it is it is fairly representative of some recent years in terms of like um, how much hotter you know with climate change it's a very was a very hot year. It was the fourth hottest on record for CONUS, um, and it had the hottest summer on record for Europe. I don't know if any in the audience today um, live in the Pacific Northwest, but that was I think also the year we had this horrible heat dome where we had like major record-breaking hot temperatures. It got um, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, or maybe it was more. I think it was like 113 degrees Fahrenheit at the Portland airport. It was really insane. Okay, so um, here I'm showing a, what we call a phenological event map for the year 2021. Um, so these phenological event maps, they basically show predictions in date formats. So I'm gonna walk you through this map. First of all, I just wanna point out that this blue line right here, this represents the approximate range boundary of 16 native Fraxinus species in North America. Areas that are within um, the, this range boundary, these are predictions of when first adult emergence is predicted to occur. I've kind of like uh, semi made that se the color semi transparent just because I'm focusing in on these native the native species here. Um, okay, areas. Okay, these gray, the light gray areas, those represent areas where not enough heat accumulation has occurred for adult emergence to even occur. The medium gray areas are predicted to be under moderate stress exclusion. Okay, the dark gray areas are predicted to be under severe stress exclusion. So we have a lot of cold stress up in Canada, <clears throat> parts of Canada. We also have a bit of heat stress down in the Southwest here in parts of California, then down into Mexico. So, um, I mean, the first thing you may notice is that basically within the range of the ash trees, the native ash, there are no areas except for in Saskatchewan um, and Manitoba, there's really no areas that are predicted to be climatically unsuitable for EAB. This isn't too surprising of a result. As I mentioned, there have been previous risk maps, you know, uh, establishment risk maps developed for EAB, and that have suggested that potentially it could occupy, um, establish across the entire range of ash. Um, and then in these areas in the Southwest, unfortunately, like, you know, um, uh, Southwestern um, <clears throat> Arizona and Southeastern California, there's really no native ash there anyway in these areas that are predicted to be under major or you know severe heat stress. And um, looking at the phenology model, we see that most emergence is predict was predicted to occur in June. Also here in Oregon, where EAB was uh, detected in Forest Grove, it's predicted to occur sometime in June. As we go further south, it obviously warms up quicker down there, and so adults are emerging earlier in the year. And here's a map showing the exact same thing, except now we're looking at predictions of first egg hatch. So in general, egg hatch is occurring a few weeks later. So we see egg hatch occurring um, as late as even October, I think, in the coldest areas, but generally um, sometime in late June um, throughout like the Midwest and uh, up and through July, um, up further north. 
And here uh, over in Oregon, we have egg, egg hatch predicted to occur sometime in uh, mid to late July. So again, these types of maps could be important for uh, detecting adults early, these areas where it hasn't established, or conducting uh, management and the release of biocontrol in with like for the predictions of egg hatch. All right, so now I'm going to show the exact same um, maps except for Europe. So again, if there's anyone from Europe in the audience or maybe someone who watches this later, this might be relevant. Um, so kind of the same thing for Europe. In this case, we basically find no areas where climate suitability or where, where EAB is predicted to be excluded by climate stress, uh, except maybe this tiny, at least in 2021, this tiny area up here in Russia, northern Russia. Um, the blue line is the approximate range boundary of three native ash species <clears throat> that I was uh, mentioned earlier. And um, within the range here, we see predictions of adult emergence and kind of similar to a lot of CONUS, we have emergence occurring in June, except down here in the Mediterranean region, um, it's occurring earlier in the year and over in the UK, it's occurring as late as um, July, you know, late July. Um, first egg hatch, same thing here where um, we have a lot of egg hatch occurring in July and um, earlier in the more Mediterranean regions. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you two slides related to model performance and basically just to try to convince you that our model is performing pretty well. The mean absolute error for adult events, adult phenological events, was only about one week. And that's not too bad when we're talking about phenology models. Okay, it's not perfect, but one week is not too bad. Um, this plot right here is showing um, predicted day of year versus observed day of year. Um, this diagonal line right here represents a one-to-one -one relationship. So if all of the points, if they all fell along that line, that would mean that the model is predicting the timing of those events perfectly. Okay, so obviously it's not, except maybe in a few cases it predicted it perfectly. Um, the different symbols are the different events. So first pupation, uh, first adult emergence, peak adult emergence, peak adult activity, and first egg hatch. Um, yeah, so if you look at the adult events, again, they're like less than eight days error. Um, and then first egg hatch and first pupation, the error was a little higher. It's closer to two weeks. But also notice that I only have three data points each for those events. So um, my, my guess is that just because these life stages are un inside the tree, they're just like not as many people are seeing them. So there hasn't there just hasn't been as many studies. It would be really great to have more data points in order to conduct this analysis again. Um, the climate suitability model also performed really well. Um, climate suitability over 20 years. So I ran the model for 20 uh, recent years. And suitability was correctly predicted for over 98% of the 3,000 uh, presence records that I used for validation. And you can see those records here uh, in Co or North America, and then also some records over here in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, so yeah, that, that was obviously great news. Um, but unfortunately, you know, this kind of provided some more uh, evidence that uh, that the basically the entire ranges of these native ash are climatically suitable based on our model for emerald ash borer. So uh, you can see the northern range edge here for the ash lines up almost perfectly with these yellow areas. The yellow areas in these map indicate that DDRP predicted climate climatically suitable areas across all 20 years, okay? So the more yellow an area is basically means that it was like suitable across more, you know, these different separately modeled years. Areas that are dark blue were predicted to be uh, unsuitable across all of the years. So zero years, it was predicted to be suitable. So yeah, I mean, you can see that there may be some years like in Texas and the South here where, uh, un where unsuitability was predicted, but just for a few years. And for Europe, it's kind of even worse where we see that um, the entire continent, <clears throat> with the exception of these um, far north areas in Scandinavia and Russia, are predict were predicted to be climatically suitable across all 20 years. Okay, so now, um, importantly, I want I want you to know how to access real time forecasts. So what I was just showing you uh, was just for the year 2021. And um, the these forecasts are more useful for the current year in terms of, you know, uh, decision support. So I'm showing you this slide again. Um, this is the, the homepage for DDRP. And I'm uh, putting a pink box here for Emerald Dashboard. You can click on this folder right here, <clears throat> uh, EAB2, and you can access every single model output from DDRP. 
You can also click on these maps and the, these, these columns here to look at the, you know, these two are the phenological event maps. Um, here we have, and I'm going to talk about those in just a second, current stage of generations and uh, number of generations per year. And again, they're updated every two to three days, um, you know, and they're always going to be at this web page right here, uspest.org uh, forward slash caps. Okay, so I already kind of, I already showed you this, but I showed you a map for North America for 2021. Uh, this again is a phenological event map for uh, adult emergence, and so this, in this case, it's the earliest date of adult emergence from the OW stands for overwintering, so it's basically overwintered adults, with climate stress exclusion for 2023, and um, this map was produced uh, about a week ago on April 4th of this year, and we see date of adult emergence, so again, um, so this is just for CONUS. We see that emergence is predicted to occur uh, in mostly in June and July throughout much of um, the northern half of CONUS, including in um, Oregon, where it's predicted to occur in uh, mid to late June. And this is interesting because actually uh, my colleague, he, he found the population. I think it was like June 25th of last year when he found it. So anyway, I'm hoping that the, you know these predictions may be accurate. So it'll be yeah good to get more data for val forecast validation. And then of course down here in the south we have emergence occurring as early as like February or even late January. But EAB is not in southern Florida, to my knowledge. But um, yeah, it occurs earlier in the year down there. <clears throat> Um, okay, so I haven't talked about this type of map yet. This is a, a, a different way to look at the, the model outputs. This map is showing current stages and generations. Um, so here in this map, you can see all of the different stages. Uh, well, um, assuming they're all present. In this case, we, uh, yeah, I think in this map, all the life stages are present at, at some, you know, somewhere in the U.S. Um, so this map was produced again, like last week on April 4th. And um, the key here, you can see basically like the generation. So EAB um, is only only completes one generation per year. So we're either going to have like the overwinter generation or the first generation. So right now, or as of last week, most of the country, most of the EAB are still in the larval stage. So they have like this kind of light, lighter blue. Some are, when you go down south, you see that there are adults in the south. And in some cases, we could even have first generation eggs or first generation larvae. Yeah, so this is sometimes called like it's a type of lookup table map. And some people like to look at results this way. And you may be one of those people. And so that's actually one of the things we want to know is like what type of maps do people want to see? Like what which maps are more useful? Um, so my uh, collaborator, Dr. Len Koop, uh, he developed this app specifically for Oregon. So if you go to uspest.org forward slash caps forward slash EAB underscore OR forward slash home, dot html um, you can uh, basically interact with these maps so like the phenological event maps and those stage i think the stage and generation map as well yeah um okay so here you can query the map you can zoom in and out and um if you zoom in you can also like click you know click on near these um these stations here and you can run the site bait we call them the site-based model so it's the eab model that's based on weather station data so and you can look at the results of that both in like uh, graph form. So here down here it's showing this uh, screenshot of a graph of adult emergence. So we have like first adult emergence and then the last adult emergence here on the on the y axis. This is degree days on the y axis and then date on the x axis. Um, and you can also look at it in this uh, graph format. So here you can see like those percentage adult emergence are in this table. <clears throat> Okay, and um, kind of what I really want to highlight today, too, is uh, the fact that, as I mentioned, the USA National Phenology Network, um, they're collaborators on this work, and they have replaced their previous model with a DDRP model for EAB. You can access these forecasts at usanpn.org forward slash data forward slash forecast forward slash EAB. And you can find um, predictions of adult emergence and egg hatch um, there. And this is new as of just like less than two, like two weeks ago. So this is like brand new. Um, this map right here is showing predictions of adult emergence. And again, this is like a different way to look at. So like I was showing you phenological event maps, this map is showing those results differently. So it's kind of like uh, this map was produced on April 3rd of this year. And it's more like kind of looking backward, looking, oh yeah, looking backward, these brown colors, and then looking forward, the more blue colors. 
So for example, in Portland, Forest Grove area where I am, uh, adult emergence is not predicted to occur for about two months or more months, more than two months. <clears throat> and in the South here, we see that um, like here in Missouri, Kentucky, Kansas, emergence is predicted uh, within like, I guess three weeks it looks like. So you can also uh, sign up for email notifications that will give you alerts when these events are about to occur. So now I'm going to show you um, a video of the visualization tool that you can use to interact with these pheno forecasts for EAB at the USA National Phenology Network. This link is here, data.usampn.org forward slash viz tool. And this viz tool is, is really cool. It's um, really, you know, the NPN has done a really great job with this. It's um, they have it for several other species. And so I'm just showing you the one for EAB. So what you do is you click on map. Uh, you go to base layer, <clears throat> you select pheno forecasts, and uh, go down to either emerald ash borer adult or emerald ash borer egg hatch. And then you can um, zoom in <clears throat> or zoom out and um, then pan the map using that little hand. <clears throat> um, and here I'm just zooming in on like the forest grove area. So adult emergence is predicted to occur in late June. And so that was, you know, remember I was just showing you that phenological event map a minute ago and it was, you know, it's basically, like I said, it's a different way of like looking at the results. Um, so now I look at egg hatch. Um, <laughs> I have to X out that bubble. I actually, I when I created this video, I should have done that. But anyway, I have to X out that bubble. Egg hatch is predicted to occur um, on uh, <clears throat> August 2nd. So a few weeks, uh, about a, yeah, a few weeks later. Okay, so um, as far as like real-time forecast in other regions, one of the reasons we're able to do this for CONUS is because we have these like near real time PRISM climate data. So PRISM is a, a climate data set that's produced by a, but a team at Oregon State University. So essentially you can get um, rasters, you know, this gridded climate data, I think for like, you know, yesterday. <laughs> All right. So, and then we also use these uh, NMME short, short term climate forecasts um, for the future. And also we use 10 year um, averages, recent 10 year averages of uh, clim prism climate data for like long term future or like, um, yeah, for air, I think like time periods beyond um, three or four months. So the problem is, is that these types of data sets are not available for all of North America and for Europe. You can, so like here, these maps, I already showed you these maps. These were for 2021. The day met data are for all of North America. The problem is, is that I think that they only release the new data like every uh, few weeks or month. And I'm actually not totally, I'm completely sure on like what their schedule is, but you can't get them. You can't get like yesterday's data, right? So, um, and then the same thing with EOBs is that you can't, they also like don't release them immediately like PRISM does. So, you know, basically it's just like your forecast will be maybe a little bit outdated. Um, but anyway, you can still definitely like DDRP can use any climate data source. And so uh, I just wanted to point that out that, you know, real time, hopefully that that will change in the future because um, it'd be really obviously great to have these near real time data sets for all of North America and Europe. Okay, so I'm going to um, wrap up here um, talking about future work and the key points I want you to take away from this talk. Um, so as I mentioned, we have this uh, US, USDA <clears throat> effort grant to um, work on DDRP and develop new models. Um, for We want to develop new futures for DDRP, or we are developing new futures. Um, we want to add additional moisture processing capabilities. So we're looking into uh, incorporating soil moisture active passive data um, to better model species like invasive plants. So plants are obviously sensitive to soil moisture. So by adding um, this, these, this type of data, we can better model climate suitability and also in some cases the phenology of certain plant species and also um, potentially other like fungal pathogens. And the uh, I, I, I don't know if it's pronounced, I think it's pronounced SMAP. I thought maybe it was SMAP, but I think it's SMAP. And this is a satellite program that's run by NASA. We plan to develop models for cheatgrass or downy brome, Bromus tectorum, which is a huge pest <clears throat> in North America and also in Europe, I believe. 
uh, the spotted lanternfly. So there's a lot of interest and in some other, you know, previous phenology models developed for spotted lanternfly. So that'll provide a really good uh, basis for developing our DDRP model. The northern giant hornet. Uh, the northern giant hornet is not known to be established in the U.S. Um, it, I think, last year they actually didn't find it. Um, so, but it has been present in the uh, British Columbia and Canada, and also parts of northwestern Washington. So it's still threat. It's still a threatening species. It could establish. So we need to have good surveillance. Um, and also for three monolinea uh, species, fungal pathogens that cause a disease called brown rot that is really destructive to stone fruits such as nectarines, peaches, and cherries. <clears throat> okay, so as I mentioned, um, we know we like we only had a few observations to validate the forecast for immature stages. We really, and I'm hoping um, that those of you in the audience today can like, if you have any um, phenological observations for EAB, we'd really like you to submit those. We're, we're going to be starting a, a big campaign basically to um, try to get citizen scientists to submit their phenological observations. And um, these data, like I mentioned, they could potentially help improve the model. And um, so we're gonna have an embedded EDMAP-S reporting form at the this USCA MPN homepage for uh, EAB. That stands for Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. And those data will be stored in Nature's Notebook, which is a project that's run by the USA MPN where they have phenological observations of various different species throughout the country. Um, and then we're going to recruit, training, and engage potential users. So one of the things with DDRP is that we haven't really yet had a lot of time um, and resources to do a lot of like advertising of how our, our model forecasts can be used. And so the USA National Phenology Network are really going to be involved with this, with um, you know, find, getting potential end users and also to creating modules on how you interpret forecasts and how you submit phenological observations. We also want to gather feedback uh, from end users to improve the formats and delivery of the forecasts. Okay, so, you know, remember I was showing you like all those different maps, like different ways you can look at the predictions. So we want to get feedback on like, what do you like? You know, what do you not like? What's most useful? We want uh, people to have a good experience. And I put SpongeBob in here just because my kid really loves SpongeBob, you know, right? So we want everyone to feel like that when they, um, you know, are using our products. Okay, so key points. Um, first of all, I have three major key points. First of all, I want, I hope I convinced you that um, we need to have dynamic modeling tools such as DDRP because climate is changing rapidly. I have in the background here a map of temperature anomalies um, in 2022 compared with the 1981 to 2010 baseline. And New York Times always has like such good map. I always love their maps. Um, you know, so obviously you can see that in most parts of the globe, the temperatures were hotter than the this you know um, uh, this these uh, temperature normals from 1981 to 2010. So you know this means that phenological events of various organisms um, are occurring are occurring earlier, or they may in the future. Establishment risk is also going to change. So, for example, in cold areas, these areas that may have previously, um, you know, reduced survival of certain pests, they may become warm enough that they can establish and spread. We could also see potential shifts in host parasitoid phenology. Okay, so um, that's not something I really talked about today, but uh, something like DDRP can also be used to address this issue. And uh, forecast address both where and when to expect EAB. So um, this can support surveillance programs. And uh, we found high predictive accuracy of our model. And unfortunately, based on this analysis of 20 years of data, we did find suitable climates across the ranges of pretty much all of the fraxinous, native fraxinous species in both Europe and North America. Um, third, forecast can address when to expect different life stages of EAB. This can su support surveillance programs, timing of insecticide treatments, and biocontrol programs. We found really good predictive accuracy, especially for adult phenological events where we found less than eight days of air, eight days air. Um, and with that, I, yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, and here are the links for the forecasts that I have been talking about, <laughs> the three different places you can visit. Uh, so yeah, I'll go ahead and um, take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Uh -huh. um, we yeah. have one um, question or comment here. Um, it says, Damon, Dame, this is from Matthew Garcia. Dame data are released in annual, in parentheses, calendar year chunks around mid March. Mm -hmm. And it says there's no chance for near real time use, is what he says. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think I thought I said, yeah, yeah, there, no, there is no, there is no chance for real time use. Um, so I, yeah, and yeah, that's, that's totally right. I thought, so I, um, okay, I thought when I went to their website, I thought that they released it in month chunks. So for like the current year, I thought they did, but I could be wrong. So like, I, like I, I haven't, I don't have a ton of experience with using Daymet data. Uh, but yeah, he's totally right. Um, so yeah, that's why we use Prism, um, Prism data, just because they have these, you know, the capability to have these uh, near real time climate data. So it would be nice, like I said, if Daymet had, you know, faster turnaround or not as much of a delay, but I don't know if that will happen or not. <clears throat> okay. Um... Hi, Brittany. This is Jen Ping from WSU. Really excited to see your talk about DDRP here. The process mm -hmm. and correlated approach both have strengths and weaknesses. Have you ever considered using statistical approach to mapping phenological events? Um, no, I haven't. Um, I've used I've used uh, correlative approaches to model climate suitability, but I actually do not have experience with doing that for phenology. I'm actually um, a little bit new to phenology modeling. I only kind of just started um, maybe like four and a half years ago. So I don't know if I can really answer that question just because I, yeah, I don't have experience, but um, I, I yeah, I mean, it would be interesting, I guess, to to test whether like the predictive accuracy of the two models. I think that we just have this, you know, this DDRP modeling tool. Um, and like I said, it, it has it's parameterized in the sense that you can have it's, um, you know, at least some moderately studied species, you could get the information you need to parameterize the model. And so I guess that's, you know, we just kind of keep sticking with that just because um, it works really well for us. And um, we have found evidence that it has um, good predictive accuracy, at least for EAB. Um, some of the other species that I mentioned that we've developed models for, um, we don't have the data to, to validate the forecast, but hopefully that will change, you know. Um, so, you know, one of the problems is that these species, uh, that they're in these areas of the world where we don't have these climate data forecasts, uh, these, this daily climate data. And so I'm imagining maybe for the phenology model, that could be an issue with, or sorry, not the phenology model, um, using a, a correlative phenology model, that, that could also be an issue where you just have these data on phenology from other countries where you don't have appropriate climate data <clears throat> to run the, the model. <clears throat> Okay, um, it says, could you link by email for participants, Brittany's internet links? I think we can do that. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Robin. <laughs> okay, are there other questions? I'm kind of letting people, I know sometimes that you, people are furiously typing and I don't want to, if they're doing that. Okay, Matthew Garcia says, thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. <clears throat> okay. Again, folks, um, you are going to get an email tomorrow with Brittany's contact information if you have other questions or comments. And uh, this recorded webinar will be available on the emerald dashboard.info website on the EAB University page. So when you want to bring that up, you will see where you can go and click on that and listen to the recorded webinar. I'm not seeing anything right now. So Brittany, I think I will let you go and say okay. thank you for all that information. Yeah. This is this is fascinating and it's going to be super useful. From I hope so. Yeah. From here on out. I mean, this is this is like you say, that's a it's a very important problem that we have to yeah. be dealing with. So yeah, yeah. No, thank you for letting me get the word out. I really appreciate it, Robin. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to talk to speak with all of you or to present. Appreciate yeah, it. It's, yeah, it's it's very interesting. And, and we really appreciate you getting up and being able to do this so early there in Oregon. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> okay. Luckily, it wasn't. <laughs> 7 a.m. 7 would have been really hard. 8 a.m. is, yeah, I, I can make that work. <laughs> yeah, All right. it's a good time. It's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, I, I bid you a good day. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>